I schemed a lot, you know, I sold drugs. I got shot, I've been stabbed. I got a perfect SAT score when I was in eighth grade. Eventually studied computer science at Stanford. Started a company right out of college, got funded. Sold that company to Groupon before I turned 24. When did you serve? I went from 12 to 24. My Harvard, my Stanford was like Pelican Bay. It was prison, bro. Hey, what's up guys? In this video, we're gonna give away more money. We are here in Los Angeles. Really appreciate all the support, all the love. I'm really doing this for fun, so all the kind words and the compliments really gets me motivated to make more great, useful business content for you guys. So let's keep building this channel. This vlog's gonna be a little bit of a different one. I sit down with Johnny Chang. You might have seen him go viral all over YouTube, all over TikTok. You might have seen him on Soft White Underbelly. I actually saw this guy on this Jubilee channel about fake gangsters and real gangsters. He was a Chinese American guy just like me, but tatted out and I was like, yo, this guy looks sick. He's super eloquent, very peaceful in terms of his actual energy and his thoughtfulness given that hard gang life exterior. I just wanted to hang out and get to know the guy and I realized that we just have a lot in common. So lots of nuggets on street life all the way to philosophy and business in this episode. Watch all the way to the end. I'm gonna give away some more free money. Let's get into it. Where do you hang out? What's your rotation? It just depends, bro. I mean, where I'm at, I'm usually doing podcasts. So whatever city I'm at, I'll have people around there. Cool. You know? but basically, like it came up around the same time, same area. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I was like hearing you talk about like the Chinese American upbringing. I think there's like a generation of us who were born here, but our parents were immigrants. Yeah. Now I think diversity being your original culture is very promoted, like diversity. Absolutely. But I think in our era of like 10, no 20 way, years. No way, bro, yeah, there was. I remember we all probably wanted to be white at yeah. some point. I think it's like a very unique generational moment for yeah. people like us. Absolutely. Yeah, in my area, it was more like we, we wanted to fit in with the Mexicans because they were bullying us, yeah. you know? So I was like, dang, like, what do we do? Do we do this? So the gangs all look Mexican. Like we are all choloed out. Sometimes you'll bang on someone and be like, dang, you're Vietnamese, but you look straight up like a Mexican dude, you know, back then. So it was, just, it was crazy, bro. So you travel a lot. What, what are you doing nowadays, bro? Just making content business. I seen you with like Jake Paul and people like that. Yeah, and that's cool, yeah, yeah, bro. yeah, yeah, yeah. What do you do no. with him? Like, how did you guys? You know? <laughs> no, content is for fun. Literally, I spend money to, to just get the brand out there. Yeah. I'm a business person. Okay. I started a venture capital fund with Jake Paul. At least the access I had with both the celebrities I had with Jake, athletes, and then elite institutional like Stanford, Harvard networks, yeah, yeah. and then just culture. Is there something interesting here? So that's why I'm doing this. That's dope, bro. That's dope. I, I'm curious about your journey. Why are you doing, I mean. Uh, honestly, bro, like, so I obviously grew up as a gang member. Um, complete opposite bro you 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 were the stereo like you know like the the token asian right the the, the i guess the the status quo for me i was like the opposite bro, yeah completely you know people were looking at me like this guy's asian like what the heck he acts more like you know whatever so for me i i coming from that background i really had like a hustler's mindset um i I schemed a lot, you know, I sold drugs. I did a lot of things like I was never good in school. I still have up to this day a GED education, right? So I've never like went to, you know, my Harvard, my Stanford was like Pelican Bay. It was prison, bro. Yeah. So it was, it was, it's crazy how the parallels are. But um, why I do this is because when I went to prison, I noticed that it doesn't matter, you know, there's people in there who were like, again, millionaires. There were people who were grow up like me, people who had backgrounds like you. There's one guy named Peter, I remember. He like, ha he went to Harvard, he had like all this stuff and he, he just got into the wrong crowd, bro, you know? And I'm like, bro, you you don't even deserve to be in here. No <laughs> tattoos, Korean dude, like glasses. I mean, I'm just like, what are you doing in here in, in, amongst all these killers, you know? But um, <clears throat> I what, noticed what, that, what, what What did he catch? What did he get uh, him, with? I mean, I can't really speak on his case, but he, he did a murder. Basically, oh, shit. yeah. Okay. So he did a murder. Not not to go into many detail, but it was self defense actually. Um, he something had happened. I think somebody tried to rob him for something, and he just like shot him. But he fled the scene, so he ran away. And then that's obviously you know. So um, yeah, he was doing like pretty much like life. I think he took it to 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 trial and he lost basically. But people like that, I always want. I always questioned. You had a great upbringing, like your family. You know, they were rich and you were in business. You know and and how did you end up here? It's because we're all interconnected through struggle. So why I do this content is whether you have money, whether you're a gang member, whether you're a stripper, whether you're what, because I also, you know, mentor like like ex strippers, OnlyFans, models and stuff like that. I, I could see that we're all interconnected with that emptiness and that void, you know, so 
that's kind of what I do, what I do, bro. Just to, to kind of plant hope inside of people. I yeah. want to see people happy, bro. Cause yeah. I went, I came from that, you know? Yeah. yeah. No, I mean, I think the <clears throat> parallel journey is so fascinating to me. We both grew up in the LA area. I happened to grow up in a, a Palos Verdes, which I think is sort of typically known as like a wealthy, nice yeah, yeah. area, a lot of good schools. Like I remember my high school class, we had like 11 of us, 11 of us go to Stanford. Sheesh. Um, but you came up in a, I would say like, what, like, like Alhambra, Monterey Park? Yeah, Alhambra, Monterey Park is kind of really, um, it's beautiful because it's like, it's it's ba it, it's affluent, but yeah. it's also bordering all these like ghettos, like El Sereno, um, Monterey Park borders like City Terrace, East LA. It's like the San Gabriel Valley area. Yeah, SGV. Mm -hmm. Which is yeah. wild to me because on weekends, my parents and grandparents would drive down to Monterey Park to eat like the really good authentic Asian food, yeah, yeah, Chinese yeah. food, the 99 <laughs> Ranch Market. Yeah, yeah. So it's like crazy because I would come down from the hill of Palos Verdes, drive like an hour and then go like spend time in like proper, it's like more Chinatown than like Chinatown. For like sure. it's where like, actual uh, the Chinese uh, diaspora lived. Mm -hmm. So like we might have like crossed paths <clears throat> like as kids running around like 99 Ranch or, some, or Maybe, something, bro. right? Maybe, bro. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But it's like a very interesting core very similar i would say like probably cultural background from like just the chinese diaspora mm. same time era but i think probably like more unique to that 90s era i would say different to like the 2020s of like i think asians growing up today is that we didn't have like k-pop where like right, asians right. were kind of cool we didn't have like that's true. what's the marvel movies we didn't right. have like cool <laughs> asians out there right um and i think i know i had this struggle when i was i think in middle school I wanted to be white because that was mainstream Americana. Yeah. We wanted to fit in because we're, we're all children. We all want to fit in. We all want to be a part of like what is cool. And like yeah. the coolest people around you were like the white kids. That's right. And I think we all had that probably that struggle of like, hey, how do we do this? We try, but we can't actually, we're not actually white. Like yeah. the culture is a little bit different. Yeah, yeah. I feel like that might sound foreign to, I think 99% of the people that are out there. Yeah. But I think for... Asian Americans, Chinese Americans around our age. I think it's a very strong formational moment for all of us. Absolutely. We all went through that struggle. I'm curious to hear your perspective. Yeah, same thing, bro. Same thing. I mean, I wasn't around uh, whites. We were around Mexicans. So, yeah. yeah, with that, bro, it was, we dressed like the cholos, you know, even to the point where, like, the older people from, like, San Francisco, because I'm from Wa Ching, you know, yeah. they were they were like, yo, you guys aren't wearing, like, the derby jackets and, like, the suits and stuff. What are you doing? You're wearing cholo pants. You know, you're yeah. wearing high socks, Cortezes. And we just wanted to be like these people, you know, we, and, and I think, but we couldn't be 100% them and right. we couldn't also like be 100% like with like the, we call them the Fabi people, right? The, yeah. the, the immigrants. So it was kind of like, it was just this weird, like middle ground of just like, and not knowing your identity and just kind of like trying to like float in all of that, you know, all that chaos and also like confusion and try to like make it out of that. I think it's very um, specific to like our generation. Yeah, no, I, rem I remember like the Fabi <clears throat> people, right? Like, I think it's like, again, like a term I think only American born Chinese use, where it's just like <laughs> white people are mainstream Americans, look at Asians all the same. It's like, no, like we feel pretty culturally different from like Chinese Chinese people. And in nice. fact, I think the Chinese Chinese people will look at us and be like, hey, you guys are super Americanized. Yeah. Like your English, your, your Chinese, your Mandarin is pretty fucking weird. <laughs> like, I remember the first time I went to um, China when I was in probably like elementary, middle school. Like the waitresses thought we were Japanese because like they didn't yeah. understand that like we were speaking English because like English was my with my brother and I yeah, yeah. our default language so we're just like talking to English to each other oh like you have some Japanese kids because like no one would think that we were like properly Chinese yeah, yeah. yeah same here same here my 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 you know <clears throat> my parents would always be like you gotta like work on your 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 Mandarin because my Mandarin was garbage bro to this day it's garbage yeah. bro and then I'm just like man and and we weren't like the the piano prodigies like you know what i mean like yeah. the protégés or whatever like people were just really um i don't know they, they people who don't come from where we come from and in our area like in that in that i guess in that year like like genre right they they're not gonna understand like anything that we're really struggling with bro i feel like the kids growing up, coming up today i'm sure you, as you i know you do a lot of work with the youth i think they probably feel much more accepting i think part of just like liberalism progressivism like mm. multicultural i think that has helped a lot of these youth today feel like they do belong in this american yeah. tapestry and i think a lot of it's like our generation had to like i think it is people in the 30s that are now like being movie stars yeah. or like pe people from like k-pop being really cool and they're like right. on all the major tv shows and whatnot but i'm curious in terms of like you know again yeah, yeah. 
grew up in kind of the same era. <clears throat> what was that tilt where you went 180? I think, um, you know, my parents weren't wealthy. From what I understood, they came to America with like $100 in their pockets. And, you know, they, they, uh, we, we fell right into Section 8, right, project housing. So I think the environment, being around poverty, being around gangs, being around drugs, it was really like prevalent in, in those areas of like San Gabriel Valley back then. Yeah. And so, um, you know, I, 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 I didn't, they tried to make me, you know, place a lot of value on school and, and things like that. But I just, I, I, my dad was an alcoholic. So he would tell me, you know, do good in school. But I would be like, bro, you're an alcoholic. You yourself don't have an education. Yeah. Like, you can't tell me what to do, you know? And but were things picking up for you? Like, were you just like kind of good at math reading or it's like you're not that good at honestly, it? Honestly, you, you didn't give a fuck. I, yeah, I just didn't care. Okay. Honestly, I never applied myself. I feel like, okay. you know, I was more like, I'm going to do everything I want to do. And the things that I don't want to do, I didn't do. Because I thought, like, if I did everything I wanted to, I'll be happy. And then if, you know, math, Kumon, they try to put me in Kumon. Yeah. I don't know if, like, I'm like, I'm not going to Kumon, bro. Homework on top of homework? Like, are you freaking kidding me? Right I was now? better than the Kumon teachers. So they're like, <laughs> so I was like, I like, I, I was doing more advanced math. Because I, I was looking at like math competition stuff, so. Yeah. But I know what you're talking about. Yeah. So I just, I, you know, and I, I would rip up the Kumon stuff and I just... Um, but I was never really good in, in any of that. I think even art, like I was bad at drawing. My circles were like ovals. I was just bad academically, bro, honestly. <laughs> and like it was so so hearing you, I'm like, I'm feeling a little jealous. I'm like, man, God, like you, you, you know, he blessed you with all that. Me, I was just like, I couldn't do it, bro. And, um, you know, I think what it came down to was like more. I think I had more like street smarts, like intuition yeah. versus like, you know, book smarts. And yeah, and, and I, I use that. Uh, unfortunately for for the gang for like you know um joining gangs in the street life basically yeah uh. no it's clearly a talent i think i mean i <clears throat> saw you as you're talking about uh some of your life story i think the way you articulate is very unique very clear thank you bro and to me it's like communication is one of the best signs of intelligence you can structure really? yeah. well what is intelligence it's organizing information Facts. in a mm -hmm. useful productive like inspiring way. So the That's way true. you can structure information and make it understandable. Yeah. I mean, I think it's relevant to me when I think about AI now, because mm, yeah. how is, you know, these large language models, these chat GPTs, they're yeah. clearly structuring language in a way that seems like it's talking to a human. That's true. Yeah. And we can get into like the math of how these words are embedded in vectors and then there's this like multi-dimensional space and like there's clusters of concepts that are close to each other. Yeah. <clears throat> but Whatever how, you know, words are installed into our brains, I think there's, I've become much more attuned to great writers and great communicators because I think that clarity of thought is clarity of expression. Mm. If you're really smart and you can't express, I don't, well, maybe you're not that smart. Maybe you just actually don't understand the concept. Oh, that's crazy. So, I mean, in some sense, like, I think your verbal acuity is quite above like quite stellar right like wow. i've talked to a lot of business people they can't really express or they have like intuitions but can't express it sure so in some sense like you have talent as well it's just like it's very interesting how yeah. it wasn't necessarily expressed in the school setting right, right, right. and you had to go through a lot of I, i'm sure we'll get into it but just like a lot of probably violent bad stuff to yeah. see that gift be <clears throat> be exposed sure but like how did you fall in, in in the first place did you have like older brother or like was it just defensive it like was you had to like do this yeah. Or is it like, hey, you wanted to make some quick money? Like, what was the initial motivation? I think for me, it was just... How old were you when you... I was 12. I was 12. Yeah, I crazy. started seeing stuff when I was 10, though. I mean, around the time you're around... So you're like a fifth, sixth grader. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I was just seeing everybody, you know, be the, the gangbang. Like, early 90s, late 90s, early 90s, mid 90s to late 90s, it was, like, pretty crazy. And so, you know, that's around my time and... and, and I just seen everyone was gangbanging. There was an era, I don't know if you remember, I don't know if it, re it hit PV, but like during like the late 90s, maybe early 2000s, everybody was banged out. And what I mean by that is they would dress like in Dickies, they would dress in Ben Davis, they would dress in, I don't know, Anchor Blue, just all this like baggy, baggy, like 5XL yeah. clothes, you okay. know? And they were just like, they would have the belt buckles that were like really long and slick back hair, dyed, you know, hair, highlights, whatever. Like, yeah. so that was like the gang gang member look, you know? And um, 
even if people even like math kids there was like this club and i think it was called like the mathletes or something like that yeah. they were just banged out too and they were doing <laughs> math competitions yeah and i was like what the heck but it just swept i think like like the whole nation at least for me everywhere that we saw everyone was like that so that was a norm for us you know? when I, I mean i think <clears throat> for my neighborhood it was i think a little bit i know what you're talking about the dickies yeah. and like that, that like belt with yeah, the buckle yeah yeah, 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 yeah. it was like the cool thing yeah but it was not like gang related it was like skate skater related really? or like emo related oh, right like there's like like the goth emo kids yeah, yeah, yeah. and then like the skater kids so i was like no i had my little world industry skateboard yeah. i was like trying to be a little skateboarder <laughs> but no like it was not the sense of gang defense gang. Yeah. or <clears throat> hustling or making money which is like let's do homework and then let's like, pretend to like go skate around a little bit with yeah, friends. Yeah, yeah. No, it was the opposite for us. It was like we were, when if you dressed like that, you wanted to be like that. Yeah. Tupac, Biggie Smalls, all the hip hop, Bone Thugs and Harmony, all that was really like influential back yeah. then. So um, yeah, and, and for me, how I fell into it was I just seen the culture and then I was like, oh, that's crazy. And then I would see souped up cars. So back then it was like Honda Civics, Acura Integras, and they would be like, you know, like big old rims and, and they would have the women, they would have like the style, they yeah. would have the money, the prestige, the respect. And I was like, man, I want to be like that. So that was number one. But then I also had a heart to like gravitate towards them because they were like family. You know, like I I, I didn't have family. at home. My, my father was there physically, but like emotionally, mentally, like he wasn't there. You know, he was always drunk, he was always beating on us. He would get mad and just beat my mom. So I seen all of that growing up. And I was just on the streets. Like, I didn't want to get home. I tried to stay out as long as I could, whether it was playing basketball or whatever. Like, so I wouldn't have to go back to that. And then I started seeing people who had their own houses. And they were, you know, like 18, 19, 20 years old. And I was like, dang, these guys are hustling. They're pulling out wads of cash. And they're giving me, like, here's 100 bucks. You know, one of the OGs. Like, here's 100. I'm like, 100 bucks is yeah, crazy. Yeah, when you're 10, you're like, yeah, that's, that's infinite money. That's exactly. like a Christmas money. Right. Yeah. So I was like, yo. And then I'm like, you know what? This is my family. So I really gravitated towards that because I felt like I needed, like, a pseudo family almost, yep. you know? There's a lot of people who are really good people. They just made, like, a, a mistake, yeah. you know? And, and they have to pay for that. And they... They're like highly intelligent. There's like jailhouse lawyers, we call them. They're like super smart, bro. And they're obviously criminals, criminals as they say, but they're very smart and articulate. And like, I think I've met, honestly, some of the best people I've met, at least speaking for the California prison system was in prison, yeah. you know? And even now I still have ties with them, the OGs and all the people that come out. And, you know, they're all like cheering me on like, yeah, bro, represent us, you know, because yeah. they think we're all stupid and they think yeah. we're all just going to rob you at the first sight, you know, this and that. But I'm just like, you know, they're actually very respectful, you know, in prison. It's it's a whole ecosystem. If you yeah. think about it, like you, it's it's all based off of a level of respect. Yes, yeah. it's flawed. Yes, there's issues, obviously. But um, when it comes down to it respect really is a big thing yeah. and in order to be respectful you can't just act like an animal you know the world looks at us like oh you guys are all animals but at the end of the day we're all human beings yeah. suffering with our inner demons and struggling with you know things that we 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 had like childhood trauma i mean all kinds of stuff you yeah. know and we're just trying to navigate through all of that yeah. yeah i mean the way i think about it is like obviously you need punishment for doing crime sure. i don't think anyone said hey you can have like I'm very pro law and order police. Sure. Like that is how society is built. Sure. But as a part of that, if people serve their time, like that is your payment to society. I agree. Once you've uh, paid your dues, you can't get double you can't yeah. double pay. Right. Right? Like you've served your time. Yeah. Now you're fully re rehabilitated. Yeah. Like give them the right to actually give people like yourself who yeah. are actually coming out the system as a new person ready sure. to contribute to society sure. treat them as like a oh, first class citizen right so you can't have it both ways right you can't like have strong law and order you yeah. put them in the system and then you fuck them on the way out yeah. it's just like yeah, yeah. you're you're putting a, a, a whole generation of people that might have made like a dumb mistake and they people should pay for that mistake sure. but once it's paid i think you have to turn and forgive yeah like that's the way i think about it so yes I don't like criminals. I think a lot of people should be put away. Yeah. Probably more, right? I think it, that's a big debate in LA and progressive cities versus yeah, yeah, like conservative yeah. towns. Sure. For <laughs> I think I feel like I have a kind of like an orthogonal approach. <clears throat> like, no, we need to put criminals away. But if they actually come out the other side, treat them as first class people. Other sure. like be clean on entry and and and, and exit. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I agree with that. I think like you know, um, there's a lot of people in there who I've seen who are like in their 60s. 
and and they're doing LWAP, which is life without parole. Yeah. But they're completely changed, bro. Like they're they're different people. They they they, they committed a crime when they were 19, you know, yeah. 20 years old. Brain isn't even like fully developed, you know. Yeah. But you know, they have to rot all the way up until they're you know 60 something. And I'm just like, man, that's crazy, bro. And I do believe it's also that, expensive for the taxpayer, right? Um, it's not. It's I think it's not less so even about even if you're just like a pure business person, you're like, hey, if we don't think this 60 year old is a threat to society yeah. anymore, and they just totally reformed. Yeah. Do we really need as a society to like, just pay for, yeah, yeah, pay yeah, yeah. for this? Yeah. So it's even like a business decision. Like, I hey, agree. like if they yeah. let them like do a job, let them, you know, work sure. retail or something, right? Sure, sure. Yeah, like my own experience with that too is when I got out of prison, like I, I was a two strike felon and there's a box that you have to check yeah. that's, you know, when you apply yeah. and then you have to be honest about that. Cause yeah. either way they're gonna, social security, they pull it up, it's, it's all there. Yeah. The criminal file just pops up. So. Um, I, I was honest, you know, I was like, yo, okay, I'm going to do McDonald's, I'm going to do Home Depot, I'm going to do, and I was trying like everywhere and I was no love whatsoever. So, I mean, honestly, so you, you like, you were humble. You're like, you were, I presume making money, you were living the high life, gangster lifestyle, went in the system and then you're like, all right, I'm going to do this right. I'm yeah. not going to go back into the, <clears throat> into the game. I'm going to. Yeah. work at mcdonald's you couldn't get a mcdonald's show yeah i couldn't yeah and they were and and, and no callbacks I, I don't i don't i remember sitting with like a friend of mine and we were like just trying to go through these different applications and at that time there was like you know the the newspapers and stuff like yeah. that you know so we would look at the classifieds how old were you when you came out i was 25 25 years okay old. yeah so i was so like, when did you serve so i went from 12 to 25 so that was 2000, 2000 to like 2000. So you're 12 years old to 25. You're yeah. in and out of the system. Yeah. Fuck. Yeah. And I, and it was, it was bad. So I came out and I was like, what's this Blackberry? And, you know, I was like, what the <laughs> hell is all this? Thing? You know? And I'm like, Fuck. and the, and the sidekicks, I don't know if you remember yeah, the yeah, little, yeah, yeah, you yeah. know, and I'm just like, yo, Flip this phones, is, the yeah. razors or the right. cool things. Yeah. Right. And I'm like, yo, this is nuts, bro. But. Um, yeah, so so I, I was shown no love, and I was like, you know what? I just I gotta go back to this. You know, I I gotta eat. I gotta do something. Yeah. And if it's not robbing people, which I didn't do at that time, it was it was trapping. You know, selling drugs. And I I got plugged in, and within a matter of months, I was making thirty forty thousand dollars a month. You know, and I was like, yo, this is the life. You know, going penthouses and stuff <laughs> like that. You know, but <clears throat> during that time, I felt that that emptiness. You know, it was weird. Like I I used to have this dream, like because I was in the projects and I was like, if I could just make $5,000 a month, like that would be enough for me, yeah. you know? But we hit five and then 10 and then 20. And I'm just like, yo, why is my heart still feeling like it's not enough? Like I want more and more and more. And I started to recognize that financially and money wasn't the issue. You know, there was something inside of my heart that was, I had no self-control basically. I just wanted more and more and more. And I felt that that emptiness and I was living this roller coaster and, and um, I, I don't blame the system 100%, but I feel like if, if you know, um, I had a purpose, because I knew, like, selling drugs, I'm hurting people and things like yeah. that. I understood that. And that contributed a lot to, like, that guilt feeling, that, that shameful feeling of, like, yeah, I got money, but the way I got this money wasn't, like, the right way. You yeah. know what I mean? And, and, and so it, it all kind of ties together, I guess. Yeah. yeah. How would you describe your projects today? I mean, it sounds like you do a lot. I, I, I see you hustling and diligent with your content yeah, like yeah. like every day you're doing live yeah, streams yeah. and talking <laughs> and preaching right you're traveling making moves yeah How, like i tell me about your kind of your core interest areas now i think for now it's just um you know obviously it's a christian-based platform for me I, all i because christianity played a big role for me it it lifted me out of all of my depression and loneliness um before i had christianity i was very um just in maintenance mode. Like yeah. I couldn't get out of my depression. I was taking antidepressants, Zoloft, Prozac, things like that. I was self-medicating, doing drugs, wax, you know, ecstasy, all that stuff. And um, it, it was up until I, I, my mom actually converted and then she kind of, you know, showed me the true, like true Christianity, the true gospel. And that saved me, bro. It lifted me out and, and made me recognize that I don't have to trust all of my thoughts, that all of my thoughts aren't my thoughts, right? There's outside influences, there's, you know, this, this destructive voice, these intrusive thoughts. But <clears throat> I, I, I recognized that I wasn't the only one that struggled with it. I used to think for the longest time, it was just me. Like, bro, you're messed up. 
there's something wrong with you and 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 that's it everyone will look at them they're happy like outwardly you know they have families and you're like broken and you're done for yeah. you know but then i started to you know kind of just give my testimony go on these platforms and i'm like yo you feel like that too and you have money and you have money and you're a millionaire and i i also like you know speak to people who have hedge fund managers and stuff yeah. and they have they're empty bro and yeah. they're drinking and they're you know doing all this stuff and i'm like oh that's crazy we're all interconnected through that yeah. so that's what i base my content on yeah. is like I'm on these lives, bro, not because I always want to be on the lives, but people will literally DM me like 30, 40 people. Johnny, are you going on live? Like, bro, I feel like this, this depression and I want to hear what you have to say. And I'm just here like planning hope. And we do these Titanic lives, bro, like three, four hour lives. Yeah. And people are still in there from like start to finish. And it's crazy. The retention rate is like nuts, bro. Honestly, that's uh, incredible. And I think, <clears throat> was, I, I think there is just the spiritual gap in modernity. My dad was from Hong Kong. My mom was from uh, mainland China. Okay. And I think a lot of our parents' generation went through the Cultural Revolution, the oh, communist yeah. uh, Cultural Revolution. So they all kind of got their culture deleted, yeah. right? Mao took over, re-educated everyone, sent everyone down to the farms. Yeah. Everyone was being, was trying to, was basically trained as a proletariat or a farmer. Right. All the traditions were Dang. deleted. Yeah. So I feel like I'm somewhat envious of my friends that come from deep Islamic tradition or right. deep Christian traditions or deep... Uh, you know, Persian tradition, Jewish tradition, sure. they have like a lot of these like cultural, like so true. celebration, like, like the Indian friends I have with the Diwali and all the celebration yeah, yeah, yeah. and all the different <laughs> gods and all the, and all the colors. <clears throat> I felt a little bit sad for our people because it, that, that richness was deleted by the so communist true. party. Bro, that's so And fast, then bro. communism is specifically a religious. Yes. And then I kind of grew up being very math and science oriented. So I was, I would say like pretty atheistic growing yeah, up yeah. and then yeah. as i've gotten older and just more i think plugged into like i think just ask, answering the same philosophical existential uh questions that i think we all ask yeah. like what are we why are we doing this yeah, yeah. i think religion is one of those things <clears throat> that have stood the test of time that ha helps at least give some answer absolutely. some sort of spirituality gives some answer absolutely so i think everyone is searching for this and i think we're using whether it's Christianity as like the sim symbol set sure. or the language to express that. Sure. I, I think what you're tapping into is increasingly important in modern civilization. For sure. For sure, bro. I, I agree. You know, and I feel like it, it's, it, yeah, it goes beyond religion. It's more about like finding our purpose, you know, yeah. through relationship or whatever it is. For me, it was obviously through religion. But um, even that, you know, I would say that, that, you know, all religions teach you to do well. You know, yeah. if you think about it, there's no like religion blatantly telling you to go and like yeah. do harm to people. But for me personally, like Christianity was that religion that like lifted me out and gave me my purpose yeah. and gave me literally the answers to everything. Yeah. And and now like it's almost undeniable. But one thing people will say is like, bro, it's obviously how it's obvious how peaceful you are. I was on Michael Francis's podcast and he was, you know, he's Christian and he's a big old Colombo crime boss. You know, um, back in the day, they were like making money like crazy. And he's one. He's the Kapo regime, which is, you know, basically the, the Don. And he was, um, yeah, he was telling me, bro, it's obviously how peaceful you are. Like, it's crazy. Like, it just seems like you're, you're just so happy and, and it's, it's nuts, you know. And I'm like, yeah, I feel that. And I wasn't like that before. Like, yeah. the, if you saw me just maybe 10 years ago, like, I wasn't that. I was like very, um, very like zero to a hundred, back to zero. You know, very crazy, very like ready nuts. to get disrespected, ready to <clears throat> put it down. Absolutely, yeah. bro. I, I had an issue with people staring at me. So if I just saw somebody and they looked at me, you know, I'm tatted down. So yeah. people are obviously gonna stare at me. Yeah. But I would just like it would take me like two seconds. Like if you look more than two seconds, I, I have to walk up to you. You know, I'm just like, what the f you looking at? You and know, then people, and I, most time, was just like. Oh, sorry. Wow. Yeah, yeah. And nowadays, you know, I, I have was like, like people started to recognize like, oh, that's Johnny from Software and Underbelly yeah. or whatever. There was these Asian kids. They were like gang members. I knew they were gang members and they were looking at me. And then I was like that, that like rage, that PTSD came out of me, bro. I was like, I think you're pressing you. Or? Yeah, I thought, I thought I was like, what the fuck are these guys looking at? You yeah. know, honestly, excuse my language. But I was like, what are these guys looking at? And like all of a sudden like they walk they're walking up to me so i'm already like, like oh, all right here we go yeah. i'm gonna get jumped you know like all right god today's the day <laughs> you know like straight up and <clears throat> they come up to me and they go hey bro 
you're Johnny from Wa Ching, right? And then I was like, yeah. Like, I was still kind of, like, not sure. Yeah. Hey, bro. And they, they, they stuck out their hand. And they're like, bro, I respect you, bro. I saw you on Software Underbelly. Like, keep representing for our people. Because there's, there's, that's, like, a part where, like, no one knows about. Yeah. Like, America just knows about, like, the like the, the, the use. You know what I mean? The, the, <laughs> the math and, and, and the smarts. And, and they don't see, like, the, the struggle. The, yeah. the people who actually live in the projects. Who yep. live, you know, in poverty. And I was like. I felt so dumb. I'm not gonna lie. I felt stupid. I was like, bro, I'm so dumb. Like, this these people are looking at me and they're they're respecting me and I'm over here like, what you got a problem? You know, it's like, yeah. man, bro. And, and and from then on, I was able to see like, wow, like, I felt like that was God trying to show me like, hey, Johnny, it's it's okay. Like, it's it's not like that anymore. People are all struggling. People are all searching. And the fact that they look up to somebody like you. Yeah is is crazy i knew they were from an enemy gang too they were from another gang they were wearing different hats and you know representing they were wearing different colors and i was like i know these guys you know yeah. but the fact that they were like they put the gang stuff down and all of that and just kind of like it, it was like it felt like we were unified almost and it was crazy bro. yeah it was amazing my philosophy on religion now is that i think we're all describing the same universal human we're, we're all trying to explore the same universal human truth sure and there are just certain sets <clears throat> of symbology and language and traditions that uh, best resonate personally to each of us. And I think sure. a lot of it's based on like the people that express it to you at the time of your life, that your parents really talk about Jesus or Muhammad or yeah, yeah, yeah. whoever, sure. you know, the deity is, you know, is Zeus, you know, the representation. Like, I think now we kind of laugh at like Norse religions or Greek yeah, yeah. religions, but I mean, I think those people that believed in that were probably just as earnest as people today For believing sure. in their deity. Absolutely. So, so, so to me, it's like, I because I didn't have a good default install base of like, this is true, everything else is false. I think I see all of them as, again, just they're all trying to express the same foundational desire and, and, and curiosity we all have. Yeah. But it's just a little bit of a different set of books, texts, anecdotes, stories, principles. Yeah. So that's <clears throat> my, I think, current philosophical state. I think I'm much more spiritual and open-minded than I was before. Because I think there is something freeing about having faith in a larger plan of destiny again i don't know if that's like god's providence sure or i'm just letting the universe play out its laws of physics sure like i don't know like the, the, the symbology set i don't have like a natural draw towards either sure but i think having a little bit of that freedom of trusting in the process trusting in faith trusting in something greater than oneself sure. does i think feel some sort of like fear that i think all of us as humans have I agree. so i'm curious about your <clears throat> spiritual evolution yeah so uh i agree with that i feel like you know in life when you when you're just thinking about yourself um people who tend to be selfish are, are not not happy right people who tend to be right all the time are not happy but when you're living for other other things when you're representing something bigger than yourself like similar to a gang you know there was that that pride because we represented something bigger than ourselves i represented watching so wherever i go I'm now leaving a legacy, right? Yeah. And when you live for other people, just like when a, a, a mother lives for a child, like that happiness, even though the child is getting blessed, it's different, you yeah. know? So giving and, and, and doing that, I think is, is really important. But uh, my spiritual journey, uh, it started actually in prison, you know? So I went to prison and um, there's a lot of religions in prison. There's people- So you weren't religious as a kid growing up? I think just traditionally, because we were Buddhist, my yeah. mom was Taoist Buddhist, so she was pretty hardcore, yeah. but it was the same as church. She was telling us to go to the temple and you know do all this stuff and Do like the bows. Yeah, and, like, the, the bowing, and, exactly. And then, like, I remember doing a little bit of that stuff, but yeah. it wasn't, I don't think my parents really believed it. Sure. It was just like kind of cultural. Yeah. Like you go to the temple and just kind of bow, do like the three bows, yeah, yeah. your ancestors <laughs> like, oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'd, burn the paper and yeah. you know stuff like that yeah. so um but I, I, that's same 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 with me and and when i went to prison you know i kind of started to explore a little bit i had a cellmate who was uh, a sunni muslim right so um and he started to I, i've noticed he had a lot of peace you know he was like very peaceful he was never in the bs he was always praying he prayed five times a day I, which I thought was like crazy. He had yeah. crazy discipline. Ramadan came around, he wouldn't eat. I mean, he was legit, you know? So I was like, you know what? I want to be like this guy. You know, I, I we had, you know, chaplains who would come in who would represent faith and Christian faith and, and also Catholics. But every time they came in, and I'll be honest, I always felt very guilty with them. It was almost always like a finger wagging, like yeah, you're holier sinner. than thou, yeah. you're a sinner. You need to stop being this way. That's yeah. why you're in here. And I didn't feel good about that, you yeah. know? So I was like, you know what, I'm gonna just, so actually them being that way kind of casted me and pushed me and propelled me towards like, 
being Muslim. Yeah. And and I, I converted actually, you know, for like three years, for the first three, three and a half years of my sentence, I was, you know, doing this. This. Um, How old are you? Like you were at that time. I was. So I went to uh, at sixteen and a half. So I was about was what 17 18 around that you're, time you're, you convert to islam yeah and then i was it was cool like i for a little bit i felt the peace i'll be yeah. honest i would pray every day because in in muslim culture if you don't pray like that's a huge sin bro it's yeah. worse than like killing somebody honestly and they can confirm that you know? <laughs> it's pretty crazy so you have to pray you have to be have that relationship with god yeah. and um so yeah so so i went through all of that and and it seemed a little bit like i was on the on the up, you know, my, my, my cellmate was like, Hey Johnny, you have anger issues. You, you know, we have anger, there's anger management courses in there. There's yeah. counseling. I took all of that when I was, you know, Muslim and he's like, bro, you got to like protect your temple, protect your mind, etc." So, um, I did all of that, but that was one thing like that I couldn't really, and, and also got my GED in there because of him, you know, he yeah. really like helped me a lot with that. But I outwardly, I should have been on the up. I should have been like, okay, I got my GED. I'm going to apply for college courses. Now I'm going to, but in my heart was still that emptiness and that void. Mm -hmm. And I was just thinking, oh, well, you know, maybe it's because I'm, you know, in prison or whatever, like that's probably normal. We're going to fill this, you know, this, this hole in my heart. But the more I was doing this, working to, to up myself, it was weird. Like the more I felt like I was nothing, yeah. you know, and it ties into making money too. So, so after that, I kind of like just left the religion a little, I stopped yeah. practicing and then I didn't do, I didn't, I was just like almost atheist as well. Like, I'm not going to believe in this. Maybe there's a God. I don't care about that. Yeah. You know, I'm going to, I'm going to do my, my, my time. And, um, what's crazy is when I got out, I was making all this money and I, again, kept filling this emptiness and this void. And I'm like, what is it? If it's not the religion that's helping me, why am I like, it should be the money. If I make this money, like why is it? And so it, it brought me to this point of I couldn't live and I also couldn't die. I was just like merely existing. Yeah. And that's when I truly recognized how miserable my life was. Like it wasn't when I was shooting people and robbing them or get, I got shot, I've been stabbed. It was when I was like, okay, I had this goal in mind to make 5,000. I had this goal in mind to be a Muslim. I had this, you know, and, and I, I reached it and still there's this emptiness. And that's when I was like, man, I really need to die. Like I, all I wanted to do was just like die, bro. I was just wake up in the morning, it's really, really big, like, you know, like pressure on my chest. Like I felt like I couldn't even inhale and exhale. And this I was is when like, you're 20, so you're one yeah, of the Yeah, and I was like, bro, I want to die, bro. But, and I tried to, you know, I'll be honest. I tried to take my life on three separate occasions and, and all of it failed. You know, I tried to overdose. I tried to take a whole bottle of pills and I tried to even like shoot myself. I mean, <laughs> it was crazy, you know, but when I thought about that- How'd you miss shooting yourself? Well- Not to, not to pick yeah, it yeah, like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> So, so uh, the thing is like, you know, I cocked the, and then when I put it to my head, like my brother actually, um, his, he, he had called from prison. So he doesn't know this. Well, he knows this, but he doesn't know to the extent, like he you're pretty about much the, saved the poetry. Yeah. He pretty that much is saved some, So that is some divine yeah, providence, no? So I, yeah. And I'm like, what the heck? Cause you know, you, you get that seven, one, three yeah. number, whatever this, you have a whatever. So I was, I was like, what? And my brother, she called. Um, I don't want to put all this, but he, he called emotional, like something had happened and he was a little like emotional. Yeah. And like when someone is like hurting, you kind of like let all of your stuff go and be like, yo, yeah. what's wrong? Cause my brother doesn't cry. Yeah. He's like this hardened gang member too. He's been in prison for like 14 years. He did 12 at, you know, 14 at 85%, which is like 12. And he was like kind of crying. And I was like, yo, what the heck is, and it, it took me out of it. It was weird, bro. Holy shit. Yeah. So I was just like, man, I, so that happened. And you know, in my heart, like I, I started to recognize that it's not about the religion. It was really like I, I, had, I, I didn't have a relationship with people and I didn't have a relationship with God and I didn't really understand. I thought I did. And through that, I was able to really recognize that when I fought, when Johnny followed himself, when Johnny made the decisions that Johnny, basically when Johnny was his own God, this was your life. Un, like misery, destruction, chaos. You know, just just fighting, bickering, you know, getting shot, getting stabbed, you know, everyone hates you. And it's just like it was emptiness, pure, pure, pure emptiness, you know, and I, I, I had to reach that level that I don't I don't think a lot of people reach. Yeah. That was my rock bottom. Yeah. And then it was weird from then on. It almost felt like it was like like God emptied my cup and he was able to start pouring in his grace, his mercy, yeah. his peace. And that's when I started to change yeah. through the word. Yeah. And it was your mother who first. <clears throat> 
converted to Christianity and she brought you on that on that, that, that revival. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Because I saw my mom too, same thing. I looked at my mom and she led by example. She was still in the project. She was still, you know, um, um, getting beat by my dad. It, it had kind of toned down a little bit, but yeah. he would still get drunk and kind of hit her yeah. time to time. Um, she had two kids in prison, me and my brother, and I had just gotten out. But my mom's peace was greater than mine's, and I couldn't understand that. I'm like, Mom, you, you don't have any money. You don't have anything. You have an abusive husband. Why are you so much more peaceful than I am? And she mentioned it. She's like, oh, Christianity, you know? And then I just, I got pissed, bro. I was like, what the hell? You're a religion hopper. <laughs> like, you, you went from, you know, being Buddhist, like, hardcore. Look at you, Mom. What's yeah. wrong with you? And then she would say some really crazy things. Like I was carrying a gun and I was selling drugs at the time. And she knew this, she knew, because I would have parties and stuff like that at the house. And my mom, she went from saying, you're a monster, you're evil, because look at you, you spent all these years in the system, you're a lost cause. She straight up told me, you know? Yeah. And then she's like, mail bomb, it's in the mail bomb, right? Yeah. In Mandarin, which is like, we can't, there's nothing, yeah. you know, and there's no hope. But she went from that to being like, Johnny, you're, <laughs> You're, like one day she said, you're the world's best son, number one, and you're the, you're gonna be a gospel preacher, the world's best gospel preacher. Right there, bro, I was like, my mom's cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs, bro. <laughs> like, I was like, dude, I started looking up like facilities, like mental health, like schizophrenia. I was like, yo, my mom's tripping. But, you know, Mama Chang, right? My mom, she, she was right. You know, I, I started to change after that, you know, and I started to convert and, the faith of my mother, I feel like, plays a huge role in, in, in my life, bro. When she was able to tell me, oh, you're normal, it's okay, it really did something to me. You know, it started to change me, and, 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 and she was right. Her faith really changed me, bro. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I think your conviction and purity of thought, I think, is just inspiring. Because I think, I think what's gravitating and charismatic about your story is that, one, just so openly vulnerable. And I think so many people are just faking they don't want it to expose like just that inner That's facts bro. Yeah. and i think it's like i think part of us something you have to just hit rock bottom we're like i like i've been so embarrassed i cannot get even more embarrassed yeah. <laughs> so like one like i i think turning that corner i think is like is the at least from a from i think about it much more like a business or or i guess an economic perspective yeah, but yeah. once you truly have nothing to fear about your business models or your what what not i think you're just much more charismatic as a leader as a yeah, human yeah. you move different basically yeah. yeah absolutely absolutely i agree and i think you've just like mastered that or just have been very further much further down on that journey than than most who sure. are just i think grappling with these questions yeah yeah yeah, yeah amen i i agree i never thought about it like that you know so when you put it like that yeah because I, I people ask me like how do i be more vulnerable and i'm just like i don't know how to tell you like i don't know for me it's it's like I just recognize through the word that I'm, I'm nothing. Like, you know, I, 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 when I trusted myself, what happened? You know, the byproduct of being vulnerable is recognizing that you're flawed, recognizing that it's okay to be, you know, like flawed and, and you're, you're not, you're imperfect. And, you know, all you can do is try to be perfect, yeah. you know, and you're going to keep failing. So I mean, yeah. it's an interesting insight because it reminds me of just how I think some of the best mathematicians, philosophers, or even business people and entrepreneurs, they wouldn't claim to say that, hey, I'm the genius creating this thing. I'm channeling truth yeah, through yeah. me. Yeah, 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 it's yeah. like the math equations <laughs> or like the philosophy sure. or like this business idea that needs to happen. I'm like the, I'm the medium in which that is transitioned. So I think, I think that's a, maybe another way to say even flow state, right? Yeah. Like I think, I think a lot of people understand what it's like being in flow. We're not really thinking, like sure. things are being channeled through you. Sure, sure. And Amen. if you can like live in a way that you're just constantly in flow, which I think, like, I think you're tapping into yeah. in some way where like you're, <clears throat> you have this no almost fear you you have this no vulnerability sure yeah i mean i i also feel like you know to add to that when you're talking about flow i think everything is a medium of exchange yeah. like in life you know um conversation is a medium of exchange even life inhaling exhaling breathing in oxygen exhaling carbon you know it's like when you inhale for me uh you have to take in the information but also when you exhale you're, you're giving information yeah. so that flow is what brings life you know and i use a lot of analogies but for me like I didn't have that communication. I didn't have that flowing of the heart. It was more, or exchanging of the heart. It was more like me, 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 I, I. So I was really focused yeah. on myself. And I kind of used the analogy of like water, like swamp water. 
it doesn't flow. There's nothing flowing into it and there's nothing flowing out of it. Yeah. So it rots away, yeah. you know, and it stinks and it's just, you can't drink from it. I mean, it'll poison people. So same thing, like um, the best tasting water is the water that flows from the mountains. You know, it's flowing, it has its own filtration system. Yeah. So likewise, if I'm a person who just keeps everything in and I don't become vulnerable and I don't share my heart, then I'll rot away inside. And that's what was happening to me. Yeah. And nowadays I know, like if I just share, it's crazy. Like. If I'm just vulnerable and I share my story, people just open up naturally, yeah. bro. Yeah. They're just like, oh, Johnny, like, dang, you went through that too, bro. Okay, so you're talking about that. Yeah. I could talk about it. And yeah. I think that's what I provide in this chaos and social media is like this safe place to just be vulnerable and yeah. be yourself and like without judgment. Because I feel like everyone judges everybody. Yes, our standards are all, you know, you're better than me. I'm better than you. Sure. But I take it as like, we need to take God's standard as like the measuring stick, yeah. you know? And if you do that, then we all fall short. And we can, I, I think the byproduct of that is communication, is empathy, is compassion. Yeah. And everybody just starts to do better, bro. Yeah. I think it's like the, the way you talk about it, it's, it's very interesting. Cause I think, obviously I come from a, like a, a very capitalist venture capital, yeah. business owner, entrepreneur mindset. And I think that the alpha or the advantage of competing in a very competitive marketplace is having unfair advantages over other people. I mean, yeah. that by definition, <laughs> how do you make more money than others? You right. need to have an unfair advantage. And I think it's hard. I think it's book of Matthew. It's harder to enter the kingdom of heaven than as a rich, uh, as a rich man, than yeah, a yeah. camel going through the eye of a needle. I think that's always struck me as a very interesting yeah. um, clause yeah. Or, or, or phrasing because I think it is quite antithetical because I think capitalism and competing is about taking advantage of others in some yeah, way. Yeah. Sure. But like, I think in terms of like this spirituality, this like freedom of not, of being at peace with everyone is almost antithetical to that. Sure. Sure. Um, one of the philo philosophical quandaries I have is that it is, it feels like it's quite easy to be enlightened when you have nothing. I think like this notion Facts. of being on a monk, um, yeah. by yourself, praying to yourself, yeah. like in a peaceful mountaintop by yeah. yourself. Yeah, that's probably that's like easy mode. But how do you have that same calmness in all in the things. middle of like heart of capitalism Amen. and succeeding and having power? Because I think it's like yeah. there is something about physical power, economic power. Sure. Because you're, you're you're peaceful and you're penniless and powerless. Someone's gonna sure. take over and like burn you down. Of course. So it's like how do you find the balance? Yeah. How or, or it's like, or it's like holding both in a paradoxical state. I don't think you sure. even think it's a balance question. I think it's like right. you have to have both. Sure. I think it's like what Jordan Peterson talks about. It's not just being peaceful it's being dangerous and controlling it i think it's a very powerful way that he expresses it that's pretty like hard. you can't be a harmless man like that's called being weak yeah, yeah, yeah. you need to be a dangerous man but control that danger sure sure, sure. um sure, i agree so i think that's where it's like an interesting conversation because i think you obviously have to be smart and intelligent to get your message out to help people right so how do you think about and navigate through that uh, i mean there's a little bit of like a you can get pulled or tempted into yeah yeah uh, like a like going back on the hedonic treadmill like hey i need more followers i need more money sure, i need sure, more sure. clout and i need more influence sure um i think for me everything starts with the heart so like you know people don't just wake up envious people yeah. don't wake up covetous and, and and greedy um it all starts with the heart yeah. and, and 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 what i mean with the heart is the brain and the heart are connected and that's called the mind, right? Yeah. So um, thoughts, heart is all one thing. I feel like uh, the way you think affects the way you feel and the way you feel affects the way you behave, right? Yeah. So you're not just gonna wake up and like shoot somebody. You're not just gonna wake up and invest randomly and so like you're gonna think about it. And you're gonna, you know, kind of sit on it and then it's yeah. gonna affect your behavior. So um, I think it starts with that. And I know one thing, no matter how much money I make, no matter how many followers I have, I can't take that with me. And I think that gives me that level of peace of just like, okay, God, if you help me and you guide me with everything, I honestly believe like, and I acknowledge you will help me. I didn't think, you know, I just, just a few, like few months ago, I, I was at like 600 followers, right? I'm at 150, I don't know, 59, 60,000 followers now. And I'm just like, I don't even know what happened. I just post reels and I'm just like, hey guys, whoa, whoa. And I go on a couple podcasts and it just boosts up. Yeah. My TikTok is the same way, going viral. People clip up clips of me saying certain things and they're like, that's a bar. And then it goes viral, you yeah. know, a million, two million, three million. And I'm like, I don't even know what's going on here. You know, and, and I'm like, okay, God, like if that's what you want, whatever. Like, I always feel like it starts with just trying to help people. 
And it's it's even with like with business, you know, if you're like all about profit, 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 which is important, don't get me wrong, but if you don't solve an issue for somebody, if you don't help people, it doesn't matter. Yeah. You yeah. know what I mean? So like if you want the money to flow, you have to solve an issue. Likewise, that's yeah. that's what God has taught me. Yeah. You know, I, I don't know anything about business. Obviously, I don't have any businesses, yeah. but I know that if I help people naturally, like they're going to want to help. They donate money. They're like, Johnny, you should do this. You should do that. I'll buy your merch. And I'm like, merch, what the hell? I don't even know anything <laughs> about that. Yeah. And so I'm, I still don't have merch out. I still don't have this out, but I'm just like, let me just move forward. And it's such a beautiful thing. Versus not just like, okay, let me see, I, I gotta set this up and I gotta, and if I don't hit that certain, you know, threshold, if I, then I'm starting to spiral yeah. and I'm looking down on myself and I'm feeling like less of a man. I'm just like, you know what? If I just give it up to God, like, honestly, there's this freedom and this peace, yeah. you know? No, I, 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 I'm resonating, I'm like nodding along because yeah. the, 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 the nerdy or the business way to talk about exactly that sentiment you're expressing is being outcome dependent or outcome independent, meaning mm -hmm. that. What, when I found when I'm doing business or all my projects, I have to value my process. Like, am I making the right decisions with the information I have and sure. making the best possible play at the time? Sure. Right. Because like, I think poker is a great analogy. You can play perfect poker, but you can still lose the hand because mm -hmm. there are cards that are being flipped that you cannot control. Exactly. But what you can control is the decision and the probability matrix in which you're making that decision. Yeah. So when I give up outcome and don't depend on my happiness on the outcome, but value myself on making the right process and decision. I see. And let go of the outcome. Yeah. I feel much more at peace with making good business decisions. That's amazing. But it goes back to your point about yeah. saying, hey, I'm not look like, and I think that's, it's beautifully put, you cannot take your money with you. Yeah. We're all going to pass from this plane of existence. Yeah. And oh, oh, what are you leaving behind? It's like all, all that stuff is material. 100%. So what you, what you can be proud of is like, what kind of life you live? How do you impact yeah. the people? And then you move on yeah. and hopefully you have some, you know, descendants and children to like pass on the legacy and Absolutely. some friends, right? Absolutely. We're all just have a limited time here to like make some impact, yeah. play a little bit of games here or there, yeah, yeah. obviously try to win some games. Sure. But, um, I, I found like a lot of peace in, in, I think to your point, I don't really feel that stressed about business anymore nice. because yeah. maybe it's one, I, I'm fortunate to have enough of a infrastructure where I'm not having to worry about paying bills and, and whatnot. Yeah. But I think, secondly, I think it's really internalizing that you can only value your decision making, your process, and, and not be outcome dependent. Right. Letting yeah. external randomness affect your happiness is not a, like a robust, durable way to live. Seriously. Yeah, really, yeah, yeah, it's the opposite, actually. Yeah, yeah. it'll cause you to, yeah, you can't control those certain types of variables. I agree, bro. Yeah. It's, it's, that's crazy. Yeah, <laughs> I didn't know that it was outcome dependent, you know, all that. I'm just like, I follow the Bible, that's what the Bible tells me, and like, I live happier. You know, yeah, so. that's what I think. Like, there's like there's some universal truth on how to for live sure. a well-lived life, and I for think sure. it's what is the symbol set for sure to express that. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, bro. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for tuning in, guys. I had a blast hanging with Johnny. I think we're gonna be fast friends, and I'm gonna have in more of my content. So stay tuned on new collaborations on that front. Now the giveaway. As promised, I was gonna give away three hundred dollars. So we're gonna scroll around, and we're gonna just choose somebody. And boom, Lorwin8670, you are the lucky winner out of 500 plus entrants into this giveaway. So we're gonna check the DMs and make sure you've liked, subscribed, commented the right things. Next episode, I'm gonna give away $200. I'm gonna let Johnny pick the winner. So comment the best thing you like from my and Johnny's conversation. Johnny will pick it. You gotta both like, comment, subscribe to my channels and Johnny's channels. And we'll get to a winner in the next couple of weeks. See you guys very soon.